Yeah, so greetings, everyone. Uh, it looks like the entries have slowed down a little bit, so we'll go ahead and get started. We have a lot to uh, a lot to do today. This is a, a pretty exciting version of the workshop because we've got uh, two different kinds of activities going on in it. So um, really looking forward to all the folks that we have gathered here today and um, the folks at OLC. I really want to thank for um, uh, working with us to put this workshop on social annotation on. Um, as we kick off OLC Innovate 2021 here. So once again, I'll reintroduce myself. I'm Nate Angel. Uh, I lead marketing and communications at Hypothesis. I'm joined here by some other um, Hypothesis colleagues who will be um, popping in and out of both the presentation and the chat as we move along. And then a whole bunch of educators and folks from the Annotate Ed community um, that will be playing different roles as we move through the uh, move through the presentation today. Uh, I'd just like to mention um, for folks who aren't familiar with it, Annotate Ed is a community of educators um, and other interested folks who are especially focused on the role that social annotation can play in teaching and learning. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of institutions that um, are kind of participants in the Annotate Ed community. And some of them are gathered here today to, to participate in this workshop and kind of lead you through some things and share their experiences. Um, and we'll, we'll get to more of them later. Um, I'll just point out that this um, slide deck is available uh, is available for all. Uh, you can get to it directly through this link that I'm about to share. Um, and the slide deck has a lot of links and resources in it. So uh, you'll be able to um, get it and, uh, and <clears throat> use it as we, as we move along through the presentation as well. It has links to things like all the members of the annotated community. Um, and then I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of a warning that one of the things that we're going to be doing today is actively annotating on some documents. And so if you don't already have a hypothesis uh, account, um, you'll want to um, go to our getting started page, which Franny will put a link to in the chat in just a second. Um, and sometime during the, the course of, of what we're doing today and get yourself an account so you're all set up to annotate later on. Um, and this uh, slide uh, kind of links to a document that um, covers um, sort of, uh, oops, I didn't mean to advance that, that covers sort of like the mechanics of doing that work. Um, and so uh, it's something that you can share, read yourself or share out with other folks who might be participating. Um, but I just wanted to give you a little bit of warning. We'll come back to that right before we start the actual annotation activity. So um, just to talk a little bit about our agenda today, we got three parts. My colleague Jeremy Dean is going to start things off by um, uh, kind of making sure that we all understand what we're talking about um, when we talk about social annotation and teaching and learning. Um, then we're going to move to our special guest from Metropolitan State University, Denver, um, who are going to lead us through a hands-on annotation activity around the concept of instructor presence. And then for the final part of the show, we're going to have a special episode of our Liquid Margin show um, with a couple of guests um, who are going to be focused in on social annotation in science, uh, which is uh, a field that's really um, starting to kick off now. Um, and uh, so uh, that's the kind of action packed agenda we've got for the full day uh, and uh, want to keep us moving so that we <laughs> have enough time to do the really juicy parts. So um, my colleague Jeremy is here now and I'd like to pass the baton over to him. He's going to spend just a few minutes um, helping everyone understand um, what hypothesis is uh, and what social annotation is and how it's used in teaching and learning. Do you want me to advance the slides for you, Jeremy? Uh, that'd be great. Or uh, actually, maybe if I take over, then it'll double as refreshing them because I think I sure. deleted a couple. Does that work? Uh, okay, sure. Yeah, let me uh, stop my share. So I'm I'm super psyched to be here. Uh, absolutely, the number one conference I miss going to uh, in this uh, age of the pandemic um, is OLC. So I'm glad that we're still working together, OLC friends. Um, and Nate and his team have put together a great program for everybody today. Um, and hopefully, uh, I don't know if it'll be the fall or the spring, but it's, um, I'm hoping to connect with some of you guys face to face um, in the near future. Um, I'm an English professor by training. Uh, I've been working in social annotation for about eight years now, um, but I'm an English professor by training and I taught high school English as well. Um, and I got in the habit very early on in my teaching career of handing out a poem by Billy Collins on day one of, uh, of every year or term. 
um, to try to inspire my students to annotate uh, because I knew it annotation had been so critical for my own success as a student, uh, as an educator and as a scholar. Um, and I believed it would be key to their success in, uh, in my class. Um, and so just alongside the syllabus, I'd hand this poem out and attached to the syllabus. That's how critical I thought the practice was for their success. We have all seized the white perimeter as our own and reached for a pen if only to show we did not just laze in an armchair turning pages. We pressed a thought into the wayside, planted an impression along the verge. In terms of getting on the same page, you know, when I met with students face to face in the class, I felt like it was easy to get them on the same page. We'd get the book out, we'd have great conversations, our fingers would be on certain pages, they'd be scribbling notes in the margins. Uh, we were all, you know, quite literally on the same page. And when I first discovered social annotation, the thing that excited me was being able to extend that sort of being on the same pageness. Um, annotation is, is nothing new. Uh, it's been around, it's an age old, you know, uh, learning technique, if you will, an age old learning technology. Um, students, scholars, educators have been writing the margins of the book since probably before the invention of the book. Um, but as more and more content moves online and reading moves online, we lose the ability to practice this, uh, you know, age-old practice of, of annotation. And part of what Hypothesis is doing is trying to kind of resurrect the margin, if you will, uh, for student note-taking. Um, but there's a lot more that we can do when we take annotation online than just take notes or scribble notes to ourselves, although that's, uh, you know, an important part of the practice. Um, I love this quote from uh, Jennifer Howard in the Chronicle of Higher Education, actually about eight years ago, talking about social reading and social annotation. Online, a book can be a gathering place, a shared space where readers record their reactions and conversations. And again, in terms of extending the vibrancy of a face-to-face -face classroom, thinking about you know, creating spaces online that are authentic for us and our students to engage with each other and with our course content. Uh, I think the margin, again, is the place uh, to do that. Um, this is our vision at Hypothesis for social annotation that any website, article, ebook, uh, document, or piece of multimedia can have multiple layers of annotation. It can still have that private layer of marginal notes that you see towards the bottom there, but there can also be a public layer. I think today we'll be working in a public layer on top of, of, a, of a document when we, when we annotate together. Um, and then there are private uh, circumscribed group layers as well. You can have a group for your colleagues to cook to read together the, the latest publication in your field uh, or a group for all your courses so your students can read and annotate together, uh, learn from each other uh, in the margins as they work through course material. There are three top level takeaways that I wanna share uh, from students and instructors that I've worked with over the past eight years uh, in social annotation. Uh, the first one is that nothing new piece of annotation, but it is new in the sense that a lot of times when we read online, we don't have a place to take notes um, or to have uh, conversations. Hypothesis makes reading actively, and this is what annotation has always done. Um, Larry Hanley at SF State writes, I want students to learn the profits and pleasures of careful engaged reading. To cultivate this kind of reading and learning, I've tried a lot of previous annotation tools, but Hypothesis finally delivers on the promise of digital annotation. Um, one of the neat things about the screenshot here is the way in which social and digital annotation expand the ways that students can be active in a text, uh, on a text, the ways that they can show that they've done the reading, the ways that they can show their own expertise. In this particular example, you see students annotating with images. The assignment called for students to attach an image to a particular piece of text within the poem. And so they all went and found different images from different sources online and expressed themselves through that multimodal uh, pathway, um, which I think is a very, very powerful way to sort of extend the different types of ways that, and different types of learners that can engage and uh, be successful uh, in a course. This one I think is, is pretty radically new, at least it is for me in terms of my own teaching history, that hypothesis or social annotation makes reading visible. When I handed out that Billy Collins poem uh, on day one, I would say, you know, go forth and annotate. And then I would grade four weeks later some summative assignment like an essay. Um, and I didn't see my students reading. I didn't see their annotations. I didn't see a lot of the 
most of the work, frankly, that they did before they handed in a five page uh, essay that was the product of a lot of micro processes uh, that go into the or formative uh, processes that go into that final summative work. And one of the most powerful things about social annotation is making those processes visible, um, knowing that our students have done the reading, also knowing where they were confused, where they were excited. Um, being able to nurture a particular line of inquiry that a student uh, hooks into on a reading um, and being able to address those earlier formative moments to help our students develop the skills um, that they then would you know put on display in a final product uh, like an essay. Linda Parsons at Ohio State uh, says about uh, hypothesis or about social annotation, my students annotations give me a window to their thoughts and understandings that I couldn't access Otherwise, I wouldn't get this depth of interaction in a threaded discussion. And then finally, uh, hypothesis makes reading or social annotation makes reading, of course, social. Um, and again and again, every time that we poll students on their uh, you know, use of hypothesis in the classroom and what excited them, uh, it's the social piece that they, that they latch onto. They love being able to see uh, their other students' comments and learn from, their, from colleagues um, and share their own ideas. And this was powerfully put by a student of Robin DeRosa many years ago at Plymouth State who wrote a blog about her experience in, in Robin's class. Uh, Shannon Griffiths writes, hypothesis is my literary Facebook. When I'm reading, I sometimes wonder, does anyone actually understand this? Am I crazy? With this brilliant tool, I know I'm not alone. I know I certainly had this experience in grad school of feeling alone inside of text. I think it's a healthy thing to be alone and to grapple with difficult text, um, but learning is social. And so it's also important that uh, eventually you have other people to uh, connect with and make meaning with around text. I'm gonna close by just sharing five uh, takeaways, uh, you know, as, as people in this session may think about annotating with, with courses or with colleagues. The first is just a reminder that this isn't just about the sort of you know reading and, and writing and, and, and literacy development, that it is just as much about community as it is uh, about annotation. And, and many of the instructors that give us feedback about why they found the tool powerful, they talk about this, the development of collaborative skills that they see their students are, 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 are working on as they, as they annotate socially with each other as part of the course and how those skills and collaboration transfer to completely other aspects of a course, other, other aspects of other kinds of group work that might be done in a course. Um, one really neat thing, and then Ramey, who's on, on the horn today, knows a lot about this, um, is students annotating ancillary uh, objects that are part of a course, like uh, their syllabi, like the syllabi, syllabus for a course, or lecture notes, or even a, a PDF of a slide deck. Of, of a lecture. Um, this is a great way to, in a low stakes way often, uh, get students using the tool, get students interacting around the course. Um, again, you know, in, a, in the context of the pandemic, some of these moments where you might have a conversation about the syllabus or about a reading assignment or about an essay assignment aren't happening um, when, uh, when we can't meet face to face. Again, turning this tool on opens the margins back up. So you can just turn this on for personal note taking and, and see what kind of social ways students will leverage the margins for, uh, for their learning um, and connecting with, with their colleagues. Many of our instructors will go through and pre-annotate a text for students, um, possibly with model annotations of what they want students to uh, be, be doing themselves with annotations, sometimes as signposts or guideposts for students as they go through a difficult text to help them get through a text. Um, and also uh, sometimes just dropping in, you know, discussion questions, uh, kind of taking the uh, discussion forum uh, that's often found in a lot of learning management systems and, you know, having a sort of more authentic and horizontal way uh, for students to ask questions the, or for teachers to ask questions and students and teachers, uh, instructors to collaborate uh, around discussion of those questions. And then finally, you know, really the bread and butter of what hypothesis is for uh, is for asynchronous seminar style discussion. Again, you know, for me, the thing I always loved about teaching was that uh, meeting with students in the classroom and having a conversation, that's what gave me the energy. Um, and it's about extending that space uh, beyond the physical confines of a classroom, continuing discussion online, continuing the, the interaction with peers uh, online uh, through the margins of a text. 
And with that, I think I will kick it back to Nate. Yeah, and you can stop sharing your slides because again, they need to be refreshed. <laughs> We're on a, uh... All right, let me get the right page up here. Share again. Thanks for that, Jeremy. Um, I hope uh, I know we've got a lot of veterans here who are uh, very practiced with social annotation, but we also probably have some new folks and it's good to make sure that everybody kind of understands the general ground of, of what we're talking about. So now we're going to actually move to um, a, a more hands on activity with some um, guests from the annotated community, all from the Metropolitan State University in Denver, my home state. Um, and I'll just remind folks again that uh, you will need to participate along with us. We're going to do some social annotation. You will need uh, a hypothesis account to do that. Um, so, Franny, if you could put the getting started link. Uh, back in the chat again for anybody who doesn't already have a hypothesis account you're going to need that um, to get started and so now i wanted to uh, actually introduce the folks that we're going to be um, talking with today we've got three educators all from metropolitan state university denver like i said um, and so if you folks would uh, come on camera um, i'd like to um, uh, introduce you and uh, just ask a little bit of background about what brought you here today and the topic that we're focused on around um, instructor presence. And so, um, so Rebecca Cottrell, uh, Ann Oberman, and Meredith Jeffers um, uh, all come from uh, MSU. Um, Rebecca and Ann from the Department of Social Work, and Meredith from the Department of Modern Languages, and they're all um, practitioners using social annotation in their work, um, as well as uh, folks who think more broadly about um, kind of learning design and learning affordances. And they've been doing a lot of interesting work with a whole team of other colleagues um, on the concept of instructor presence. And so I wanted to just um, kick things off first by um, inviting Anne up uh, to, to unmute and come on stage um, and tell us a little bit about what brought you all here today and your personal connection to uh, social annotation around the idea of instructor presence. Thanks, Nate, and the Hypothesis community. Um, it's great to be here, and it's fun to be here as well with Meredith and Becky. We started off as a faculty learning community at MSU Denver, and it's almost three years ago. This is our third year, and it's kind of continued informally um, past that initial year that we were slated to do more of a formal uh, faculty learning community. And what happened was that Becky, was finding that there was a lot of training around design, um, but not around online instructor presence and what that meant and how it's manifested in our classes. And so a group of us got together. There was the three of us, um, a couple other social workers, a math professor, our AVP for online learning, um, all got together and talked about online learning presence. And one thing that came up as one of those tools, we were talking about what tools increase our presence. And one of those tools that we discussed and played with was hypothesis. And the thing that we thought, that a lot of the examples that Jeremy was giving before around that student piece, but it also allows faculty, faculty to be present in the class. And so not only are students heard and seen in hypothesis, but faculty are felt heard and seen through hypothesis. And so that's kind of the long roundabout how we got here today and what we really value about using that tool. Great, that's that's good context uh, for me and for all our guests here today. Um, and Becky, uh, I thought it might be good also to hear from you about your kind of your personal involvement. That's a little bit different than Anne's, if I'm not mistaken. Absolutely. So I was also part of the FLC that we joined in together, but at the time I was teaching in the modern languages department, I was a Spanish instructor. And since then I've graduated with my PhD in curriculum and instruction. So congratulations. I, thank you. Um, so I'm taking on that role as um, online and hybrid curriculum development um, and um, support in the social work department. So I am not currently in a teacher, but I support a lot of folks who use um, tools to engage with their students. So that's one of the conversations that I have a lot. And um, again, hypothesis is one that they come back to again and again, as they like to be able to annotate things together. 
Great, that's that's really good to hear. And, uh, and so I guess you've actually shifted from uh, from modern languages over to social work, uh, moving moving that practice. But your colleague, your former colleague from um, foreign languages, Meredith, is here today, who has a kind of a different um, connection to social annotation. Meredith, you want to tell us a little bit about what brought you here today? She's still our colleague. There's no former. That's true. Yes. Um, I actually think Jeremy touched on a lot of the primary uses that I have of hypothesis in different sections. Um, but one of the reasons I got really into it is was before COVID, I was tasked with building and maintaining and sharing quite a bit of asynchronous online courses that were also with an eye toward making them open educational resources. And so hypothesis has become kind of the perfect way um, to come at it from both angles, which I think is what Becky and Anne were getting at. One, to see what students are working on and how they're working through a text and where they're getting hung up on a particular translation or term or concept or a theoretical lens, but also as a way for me to direct their attention or check in or let them know I'm present and still there seeing what they're doing rather than just having you know a grade in a column. So. I recently learned actually from, from Nate and Franny that there may be a way to tie Flipgrid to hypothesis. So if those two worlds can combine, then I will be the happiest faculty member in the world. That would be great. Yeah, so one thing, when good things come together, right? Yeah, so we've, um, there's been an augmentation to hypothesis recently that enables you to just um, post a Flipgrid URL into an annotation, much like you would a YouTube uh, URL, and it will automatically embed that Flipgrid in that annotation. Um, so that should, 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 I actually haven't tried it myself. So I, that's the only reason I'm saying it with some hesitation, but as I, I understand it, that's all up and working. Um, so I would love to hear if anybody has tried that uh, here in the audience, um, feel free to let us know in the chat, that'd be great. Well, um, so without further ado, um, I've asked these folks um, from MSU to um, uh, lead us through an actual annotation experience, sort of like Kevin was saying in the chat, like let's use social annotation for professional development like these guys have um, as a community, right? That's not only something to bring to students in, in uh, you know, the regular classroom, but also something that we can use as educators to read together and connect with each other. And so um, they've selected a couple of uh, specific texts. Um, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen again. Um, uh, and we're gonna start off um, with uh, just a kind of like warm up exercise as I understand it um, uh, around a poem by Langston Hughes and then move on to something that's actually more focused on this topic of instructor presence itself. Um, and we're gonna annotate together in that. And so did you guys elect a spokesperson <laughs> to kind of talk a little bit to kind of situate these readings for us or maybe you all have something to say about it? I'll start just real quickly. And so with the theme for English B by Langston Hughes, of course, Langston Hughes, there wasn't online education when, when, when he was writing this poem. Um, however, it really talks about online instructor presence and student presence in our online courses and how to humanize those environments. Um, and so I encourage you to use your lens when you're looking at it. And there are already annotations in here. Um, so it's been publicly annotated before. I think there's some 2020 references in there and so forth. Um, but when you get in there, think about your students and how they are seen, felt, and heard. And then also think about how you are um, seen, felt, and heard in that online environment. And so that's that first one. Do you want me to wait, Nate, for the second one? Um, well, you could maybe just give us a, a little foreshadowing of what you're thinking that we might, what we might do in the second reading as well. Um, but we can focus on the poem first, but if you want to just like introduce the second one. Yeah. And the second one is an OER um, resource that is, it's a, it was run as a MOOC a long time ago, but it's humanizing online teaching and learning. And it's chapter three, let's talk effectively communicating with our online um, students by Sandra Mitchell Holder. And this is more of a practical reading. And so I encourage you in this one to share your ideas, share what you're doing in these classes, share maybe what's a struggle for you, but how are you communicating? Where does your online presence show up your voice um, with your students? And so the reason I'm kind of catering it to that online instructor presence is that's a presentation that we're giving as our faculty learning community at OLC. And so it's just kind of honing in on how to use this tool 
um, in these readings around presence. Great. And so I've pasted the link to the um, Langston Hughes reading uh, there in the chat. And then here's also a link to the second reading um, that, we'll, that we'll go to in a second. Um, I've got the reading up here on my screen. Um, would, would you prefer, Anne, to share it on yours? And I'll just, I've just been um, sort of fiddling with it a little bit um, as we get started here to show what the hypothesis controls look like. And so as you can see, as Jeremy was pointing out, when you bring hypothesis social annotation to a reading, you're bringing it to the reading where the reading lives. And in this case, it's a poem posted on the Poetry Foundation's website, right? And um, the links that we provided are special links that bring up the poem in the, with the hypothesis annotation sidebar kind of added to it. Um, and so you can see it's kind of subtle, but in the upper right hand corner is this control that opens and closes the hypothesis sidebar. And a lot of people don't realize this, but you can resize the sidebar by grabbing the chevron that opens and closes it, and you can make it wider or skinnier. Another thing that people might not know is that you can click on this eyeball to both remove and show the highlights from the annotations. So if you'd like to have that clean reading experience without having all the highlights get in your way, you can flip the eyeball off and uh, uh, it will hide the annotations. And then you can see, as Anne was mentioning, that um, you know this was a poem that was annotated by other people, students, educators, different kinds of folks already in advance of what we were doing today. Um, and so there's already a series of, of public annotations um, on the document itself. Uh, and so uh, the mechanics of actually annotating for people who don't know it are relatively simple in the sense that you highlight something, some words on the page, right? And when you have hypothesis enabled, that brings up this little selection tool, which you can decide whether you just wanna make a private highlight for yourself or whether you wanna make an annotation on that text and the annotation can be public, private to yourself, or as often happens in the classroom, shared in the context of a private group, um, whether that's inside the LMS or outside the LMS. Um, and so we're gonna be annotating in public today. Um, and so I'll stop talking about the mechanics of annotating um, and, <laughs> and hand the baton back to you, Anne, in case you wanted to guide folks around this document. I think one other thing I saw in the chat was people were asking about size of group. And so this is a really small poem for a really large group of people. And so there'll be a lot of, um, there's precious real estate, right? And so feel for, I mean, you can kind of shut those down, look, go back and forth. And so really when we're doing this with students, we can do many different things. But I think if we can just start, Nate, I think that would be great. And really, um, again, thinking about how you're showing up in your class, how your students are being seen and heard. Um, as you read this poem. Sure, so let's, um, I'll actually be quiet and um, let folks read and absorb the poem. Um, and let's start um, annotating it together uh, for about you know, five minutes and we'll come back. Let's, let's say we'll come back at 8.40 uh, and after we've spent some time annotating on the poem. Sorry, I said I was going to be quiet, and here I am already talking again. But um, one thing to note is as new annotations appear on the page, you'll see a little red indicator um, uh, in the top of the hypothesis sidebar, a little arrow pointing down that, that'll turn red. And that's letting you know that there are new annotations. And if you click on that arrow, it will bring the new annotations into your reading context. So I had just done it to my page, uh, so I refreshed it um, with new annotations that people had made already. And this is the one of the things that we notice with a short work, right? We've got, you know, 70 people looking at this one short poem right now, and it's become like a dense web of yellow as so many people have highlighted this short text um, to make annotations. And so this is one of the things that happens, right, is the density of the document versus the number of people who are, who are sort of reading it together can be, can be a, an interesting balance, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, and of course, that is one of the things that annotating in private groups, like for classes, can help ameliorate, right? Because each private group's annotations only appear to the members of that group. And so you don't end up with this kind of dense public uh, set of annotations. 
um, yes, uh, Swati, we will be recording that. We are recording this session and we will be distributing it um, afterward. Sorry, uh, so folks from MSU um, and Meredith, Becky, did you wanna say more about um, what we've been doing here on the poem or what we've been seeing? Yeah, and so just pointing out some different people's comments. So, and I'm gonna be referring to your little handle. So excuse me, I don't know your full names, but Gunder was talking about history. So bringing in past context in their own history and placement in the poem. Um, Jeffers was asking questions of others, trying to get clarification just on where what was Langston from? Where did he go to school? Where was he studying? Um, an image was shared to give that context and concreteness. Bucknell talked about physical space, about being disembodied and how this poem brings it in. And so all these different avenues um, or just ways of learning and seeing that poem come in. Also talking about identity. So in social work, we're talking a lot about social justice, how our identity, how me as a white woman impacts how I'm teaching students. In hypothesis and, and social annotation allows students to engage in some pretty difficult conversations with the text being the main focus. So it can kind of take away some of that initial bite as you're building trust with students and as they're engaging. Um, and so I just wanted to point out some of those comments that were made. Um, that really got to that point of those inst different instructor presence. Becky or Meredith? I had also um, noticed a comment by A. Gunder um, about sharing a personal experience. And then you said, it reminds me that as much as we open up our vulnerabilities, we create space for connection, for deeper understanding and for extensions. It's what I hope our collective work in education will do. And I just think that captures both the essence of this poem for me and what we're doing in an online space. I think sometimes it's harder to connect online and I love this. Uh, so I love that we can use that uh, to do some metacognition as well as um, interpreting the, the text that we're reading. Yeah, and then I guess I'll be the practical voice. Um, if I had a group of 80 students, which would probably never happen in my discipline, um, but I have had groups between, you know, 35 and 40 students. And so to avoid this kind of situation, um, where you've all now experienced, like you're scrolling through a hundred different comments and everything is now highlighted. So it's hard to see what students are really looking at. I would typically add to the instructions, um, you know, either assigning students groups and say, if you see someone from your group posted first, you need to reply to them to have a mini thread focusing on something. Or I would go in um, and scaffold, like pre-select some things if I wanted to guide the discussion. Or you could say, um, if something's already been highlighted, please don't put a separate annotation. Please respond to that person. If you see a question, answer that. So there's ways to structure this so that you don't end up with the entire text highlighted, which may defeat the purpose. But if from another angle, this is a shorter poem. And Langston Hughes is a brilliant writer and thinker. So it is entirely possible that every single word except the and said would need to be highlighted in this to really get all the juice out of it. Um, but there are different strategies. And I found, um, I know that Ni is keeping up with the chat, but I found a lot of good resources. Um, and I started looking at the Liquid Margins podcast too. So if you have a discipline specific question or lesson plan that you're trying to think through, there are fantastic resources at, at the website for Hypothesis to help structure this. Yeah, and um, I, I know Nancy's been talking a lot about more student resources. And yeah, there are some simpler ones. That link I shared, Nancy, was to like every single guide that exists. So um, some of those are, are much more um, simple. So um, yeah, Franny, could you put a link to the Hypothesis one-on-one -on -one webinar recording for that Marissa asked for into the chat there? So I just wanted to point out to a couple of other affordances in the, in the tool itself here. And so you may have been watching as I um, navigate on the page, um, people were talking about maybe, you know, wanting to see, uh, to sort or view annotations by date. And so this little tool at the top of the arrows, you can actually sort by newest or oldest or by document location. So they're in the order of the document itself. And then there's also this search feature, right? So if I just wanted to see annotations by someone who had March in their username, I can search that. And so I can sort of do some filtering in the tool itself to reduce the number of annotations and kind of the cognitive load of it. Um, so those are a couple of other uh, tools in the, in the tool itself. And I'll just point out one other thing, and that's that um, 
the annotations themselves, which, and here's this link that we've been using to get to it. So this, this link that you can copy and share with other folks leads to this entire poem and the annotations embedded on it, right? So that's a very handy thing. But then every annotation, each individual annotation is an addressable, uh, addressable document as well. And so that same icon on each annotation provides a link that you can get, share with someone to link to not only the document, but that specific annotation kind of highlighted in the document. And so that's another uh, another great affordance in there. And then someone had asked about the difference between page notes and annotations. And I mean, I think, you know, maybe the folks at MSU have some ideas on this too, but page notes are sort of notes about the document as a whole, if, if you will, whereas annotations are about some specific text that you've anchored um, in, in the document itself. Do you guys have any, have you seen any uses of page notes or, or think about them in a different way? No, that's how I typically explain them to Right. Well, so we spent some time on this poem, and actually there's now, um, what is there? There's over uh, 80 annotations on it, plus some page notes. Um, so great stuff. Um, why don't we shift over to the second document that you guys uh, had brought to our attention, that this one focuses most directly on um, instructor presence. And I'll bring that up on the screen if someone from your side there wants to kind of introduce it a little bit more and talk about it. Why did you pick this document? Yeah, so this one, again, it's part of humanizing online teaching and learning. It's an OER. And so just thinking about when I share documents with my students, oftentimes I'll share different sources, different resources. So kind of the multi layers of learning. So an open educational resource um, by Sandra Mitchell Holder. It has really practical ideas. And so for this one, I'd love to hear what you all are doing, designing, teaching um, with your ideas. Like not only what does it bring up as you're reading it, but what are you doing in these areas? For instance, when they talk about how we're um, encouraging communication. They don't list hypothesis as one of those ideas down there. So add, let's add our ideas to this and maybe try replying to people too. So practice that skill and see how that feels as far as creating conversations with others. Um, so trying out some of those other um, hypothesis tools that we can use. But really, again, it's how are you being heard by your students? How are you communicating in the words, um, in the lack of words, in the space, in the margins? Again, how are you being perceived through your communication to students. So that's how it relates back to that online instructor presence. Meredith or Becky? I was just gonna highlight what Meredith had said about the poem is that now that we have a longer reading, let's invite you that if something is already highlighted to focus on replying to that section rather than um, adding a new highlight. So that way we can get some conversation going. Yeah, and you'll notice that every annotation becomes an opportunity for a threaded discussion, right? So you can reply to any annotation um, or any reply to an annotation and start a threaded discussion right on top of it. Um, and I'll, uh, I shared the link to the second document and you'll notice that Anne has kind of seeded the document with some annotations already that can kind of serve as prompts um, for our reading. And again, I'm going to refresh this little uh, red icon here to bring in any more new annotations. Also, um, I thought it might be interesting. Would one of you like to say something about the remarkable collection that this chapter appears in? Because <laughs> I think the collection as a whole is a rather remarkable document. You might know it better than I do. Yeah, there's some, I mean, you'll recognize the name. So on the, on, within Pressbooks in the contents, if you click on contents on that left side, it will open up the full, Nate just did it there, the full um, table of contents that you have. And so these, a lot of these folks' names you're gonna recognize, some of them might even be part of this group here because I know they're part of the hypothesis community for sure. Um, but this idea again of humanizing online education. And so what is it to bring the human into that? And how do we do that most effectively? Um, and so there's everything from voice and video um, to social learning, <laughs> designing. Um, and so just a lot of great meat. So if you have folks that are new to online education um, or moving um, from kind of maybe some really traditional ways of doing online education to a more interactive way, I would really encourage um, folks to read it. It's digestible, it's easy um, to read. And again, you can share it. Um, and it, it has a, I think CC BY, 
and maybe that you give accordance to, but yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a collection that was edited by Whitney Kilgore, is that right? And then with many different authors on different sections, I, I see this one that we're focused on um, by Sandra Mitchell Holder. I saw one by Helen DeWard, I, names I recognize for sure from the community. Mahabali's down there, I think number nine, yeah. Yeah, and if you're not familiar with press books, it's a great tool for book publishing, basically, <laughs> um, especially book publishing that um, in the, in an open environment. Um, it doesn't require openness, but it is specially tooled to enable um, that kind of publishing and actually has hypothesis built into it. Um, and you'll notice, too, in these books, um, there's a bunch of different ways to actually uh, access it. You can read it online. And then they also have the ability to, um, usually they have it hooked up so you can grab PDF versions and EPUB versions. And uh, I'm not finding it in this particular book, but yeah, it's a CC BY license though. All right, I'm going to um, start to be quiet now again, and let's spend another uh, five minutes, um, five minutes annotating together on this document. <laughs> um, I see a couple of people are um, wondering about how to see the whole document and annotations, and I guess I'm not quite understanding it. So the, the hypothesis sidebar gives you access to the annotations, right? And when you have it open, um, you can see the document and annotation side by side. And for instance, if you click on an annotation, it should scroll the document to the, the area that's where that annotation is anchored. Um, if you're trying to see like every single word on the page and all the annotations at the same time, that would that would be uh, that would be just like too much information to show on a screen, I think. So I'm not quite sure. Um, what people are struggling with when they're talking about seeing the annotations in the document together. Um, if you want to explain more in the chat what 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 you're struggling with, that would be helpful. So I'm going to give folks just a couple more minutes to annotate, um, and then we need to wrap up this section of the workshop and say goodbye to our good friends from Metropolitan State Denver who are welcome to stick around for the second half of the show. I see a lot of um, questions in the um, in the chat about various kind of um, you know specific points about using hypothesis, um, and we won't have time to get to all of them here in the show today. Um, but we put resources into some of the other ways that you can get information about um, more specific things about hypothesis, including our one on one webinars and our help section. Uh, hey, Julia. Okay, great. Yeah, so the links to all these documents are in the slides, um, but here's a link to the document that we're working on right now that I'm showing on my screen. And so I will um, just point out, too, that there's sort of two ways to access Hypothesis. One is how we're doing it now with a free account and annotating on the public web, whether that's a public or, or private or group annotation. And then it's also possible to embed Hypothesis in or integrated into a learning management system like um, I believe that um, Metropolitan State just moved from Blackboard to Canvas. <laughs> so you guys probably have experience using it in both Blackboard and Canvas, um, but it works and it can be embedded in all um, sort of standards compliant LMSs, all the big LMSs basically. Um, and that's a little bit different environment in the LMS because people don't, students for example, don't need to go create separate accounts. They're logged in automatically, single sign on to their LMS. And then uh, every annotation, every document that's annotated in the LMS is annotated in the context of a private group for that class roster, right? So there's not this um, kind of public private group flexibility inside the LMS. It's got some guardrails on it to kind of bring the annotations uh, just around that kind of public group of the, of the class environment. 
Um, so if you don't have <laughs> hypothesis in your LMS at your school and you'd like to have it, um, that's that's a conversation that we can get into. Um, but obviously, everyone is is uh, free to start using the the free public annotation capabilities, where you can also create a private group and annotate with your class. Although you will be asking students to go get get hypothesis accounts and so forth. So um, we're we're reaching the end of our the first half of our show here, or uh, <clears throat> and I really want to thank the folks from Metro State. Um, for for coming. Um, this is really rich text. And one of the great things about annotation is it can be a completely asynchronous activity too. We've done it in a synchronous form now, which is actually in a way sort of more complicated to try to get everybody to do the same thing at the same time and read together like we tried today. But this can is an ongoing document. We'll all be able to annotate it. You'll get notified if via email if someone replies to one of your annotations. Um, so that this can be a continuing and ongoing conversation um, as we move forward. And we'll be talking about this more on social as well. We did record this um, and we've got another hour of the workshop uh, ahead of us that we'll introduce in just a second. Um, but so you'll be getting, uh, as an attendee, you'll be getting an email that will include a link to both the recording and the um, slides, and which includes links to the documents that we've been annotated and everything so that you can revisit all this at a later time if you want as well. So um, I'd like to sign sign off then by um, thanking um, Anne, Becky, and Meredith. Did you have any closing words, folks, uh, as we move to the next chapter here? It's great to be here. And just one thing is that all these stay, the annotations stay, like Nate said. So I'll have students go back if they're writing papers later, or like if you have ideas that you thought were interesting, you can come back two months from now and your brain actually clears and you can like look at it. So I just wanted to mention that, that students can go back in and reread things that their colleagues say, digest ideas. Um, so I appreciate that time, timelessness of it. But thank you all. Thank you so much. And Becky, did you want to say anything as a parting gift? Um, yeah, just a reminder that there are so many different ways that you can use hypothesis. I'm thinking this morning of our colleague, Wendy Gallagher, who runs the translation program in um, MSU Denver, and she uses this in her advanced translation classes. And she says that it is a thousand times better than a discussion board because students can really dig in and talk about the nuances of translating a specific text and help each other and communicate. So that diversity is one of the strengths of hypothesis and the ways you can use it effectively in your classes. That's such a great point. Yeah, the flexibility is really key. Um, you can use it for almost anything. <laughs> That's great. Meredith, did you have a, a parting thought? Thank you again for having us. I think my parting thought is just even looking at the screen right now on Zoom, having hypothesis and having the highlights right here that are public to your group, it's so much more powerful than a discussion board where a student is writing the quote, but it's out of context. Like something about seeing it alongside the thought is very empowering for students and also I think really helps with retaining information and getting to a deeper analysis. So I hope everybody is able to play with this moving forward. Great, well, thank, thank you guys all so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Feel free to stick around. We're gonna have a really uh, interesting and exciting second half of the workshop here. Um, now that we've had that hands-on experience, which I found really rewarding. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I would like to um, make a transition now to introduce um, another uh, good friend and colleague uh, that's part of the uh, community here. I keep ducking down to look at something on a little tiny screen down below. Um, but I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Ramey Collier, who also happens to be in Colorado. It seems like we have a real Colorado showing in the house today. Uh, Ramey um, is uh, acting this year as the inaugural scholar in residence at Hypothesis. He is a, um, an educator focused on teacher education at the University of Colorado Denver, which happens to be right on the same campus with the Metropolitan State folks. So they're, they're neighbors practically. Um, and I know they're preparing for a big snowstorm. So they're probably um, anxious about all that. But um, Ramey is going to be moderating uh, the next segment of the show, which focuses on social annotation in science. Um, and so I will kick it over to Ramey and uh, let him take away and introduce the next part of the show. 
Well, greetings, Nate. Thank you. And what a what an engaging uh, first half of our presentation uh, today at OLC. I just want to kind of informally recognize so many friends and colleagues who I know have joined us uh, as this session. As I look through our attendees list, um, my heart is really full knowing that there are so, so many people who care deeply about um, student learning, who care deeply about the kind of ethical and engaging use of learning technology to support student learning, um, and who were just really committed at, during a very still challenging time uh, as we kind of recognize what some are calling the kind of one year anniversary of this pandemic that you all are taking time out of your days, whether it's the morning or the evening, um, to come together in community and talk about ways to meaningfully support both students and faculty as they learn through, in this case, social annotation. So I just wanted to kind of mention that, that up front. Um, we're transitioning now into what is a special episode of, of Liquid Margins. And I just want to share a few housekeeping notes before we, we formally begin. Um, I know that we have a lot of folks who, who are, who are going to watching or listening. And so uh, as you do so, please, if you can keep yourself um, muted. Um, again, the chat is open. Uh, there'll be some uh, active presence on Twitter as well to share thoughts and comments. But if you, if you could please keep your microphone muted so that we can really hear from um, our guests, that would be, again, most most, uh, most appreciated. Um, I'm going to share my screen and kind of transition us into um, this formal part of the day. Um, but since the host has disabled my screen sharing, I'm going to just continue to waste a little bit of time here and talk about, about what's going on. Oh, until we get, make sure that all of our technology gets up. How did that happen? <laughs> uh, so again, um, the focus, and I should say that before we formally kick off this, is that uh, we are now moving into episode 20 of Liquid Margins, uh, which is focusing on science education and the use of social annotation to support both science education, student learning in classrooms, and also research and research about science education. Um, we have three really incredible guests who are joining us today. And so we'll, we'll turn it over to them in just a minute here. Let me see if I can do that now. Um, uh, again, as a part of OLC Innovate, uh, and on behalf of Hypothesis, uh, welcome to episode 20 of Liquid Margins, titled Making Sense of Science with Social Annotation. Uh, I am just thrilled to host uh, and, and moderate this episode. Again, my name is Ramey Kalir. Uh, day to day, I am an assistant professor of learning design and technology at the University of Colorado in Denver, and have had really I think the, the, the highlight of my professional career has been serving during this current academic year as a scholar in residence at Hypothesis and working with a variety of colleagues and institutions to support uh, the use of social annotation across disciplines and in both creative and consequential ways. Um, we're joined today by an excellent panel of science educators and science researchers. Um, and I'll introduce them in just a moment. Um, but Nate, if you do wanna advance to the next uh, slide, this is just a general reminder that if you do use the chat in today's Zoom webinar, please make sure that you're communicating with our entire community. And so toggle to all participants and attendees um, as, you, as you take uh, those notes and share them in our Zoom chat. So thanks for that. You can also, again, follow that little link there for more information. And as a kind of preview to the next episode, what will be episode 21 of Liquid Margins, this will be scheduled for the 19th of March. That's just in a week called Northern Associations. And that's gonna be about social learning in Canadian higher education. So that's coming up uh, next Friday. So today's guests, I really have the pleasure of introducing and learning from, and I hope that we all enjoy the wisdom that will be shared by the following folks. Uh, Dr. Melissa McCartney is Assistant Professor of Biological Sciences at Florida International University. She also serves as the Director of Research at Science in the Classroom. Dr. Erin McKenney is Assistant Professor of Applied Ecology and also serves as the Director of Undergraduate Programs at North Carolina State University. And she is joined by her colleague, also at North Carolina State University, Dr. Klaus Goller, who is an associate teaching professor of biological sciences. Um, I have had the pleasure of reading scholarship by these uh, really esteemed science education researchers for really actually a number of years now, in some cases, learning quite a lot about how social annotation has supported um, science education. Um, and I'm really excited to hear from them about how 
hypothesis in particular, but social annotation more generally can support science education learning in the classroom and also science education research. And so that is our panel today. And so welcome to all of you. Um, if we might begin with just some general um, introductions, um, I was hoping to hear from the three, our, our, again, our three esteemed panelists. How did you first like, learn about social annotation generally, or perhaps hypothesis more specifically, and why, since you're all science researchers, science educators, why did this thing called social annotation kind of strike you as kind of consequential for the work that you do given your professional expertise? Anyone's welcome to begin. I can hop in. Um... So I learned about social annotation uh, and, and hypothesis specifically through the Open Pedagogy Incubator, uh, which is an amazing program um, held through the NC State Libraries. Uh, so I got to participate in their inaugural cohort and learn about all sorts of different open educational resources and ways to really engage students in um, in fully accessing content, right? So lowering accessibility barriers, but also in, in taking ownership of co-creating learning materials, um, which I think a lot of times these annotations are. Uh, and then I think of course, uh, it was kind of perfect timing with the incubator to be thinking about ways to, to lower accessibility and to increase inclusivity um, at a time when we're all remote uh, and to build community online. Um, yes, so I, I can answer too. Uh, so I probably, I think I started working with Hypothesis probably in 2014. Um, and we were actually approached, um, someone named Jeremy, I'm blanking on his last name right now. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, like the Jeremy <laughs> Dean, our, our college. Yes, 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 yes. Dean, yes. <laughs> yes, he, he came and found us and we had some really great brainstorming sessions with him. Um, and we, we kind of use annotation or Hypothesis in two ways. Um, one, because of the way it um, kind of the, the back end of the software makes it very easy to pull in to our to our website. Um, and then the, the second reason is um, kind of uh, what Aaron was saying, like it, um, it gives people ownership and we started using it as a professional development training for graduate students who were looking to get more into science outreach and science communication. Um, and we use the annotation tool as a way to help kind of break down, you know, like hardcore science papers um, so that they would be more easily accessible to the public. Um, so we kind of did it in parallel with the training on how do you, you know, how do you break down complicated science, um, kind of giving them background on that side of things. And then hypothesis and annotations were really the, um, the, the delivery route um, to, to make that all come together. Thank you so much. Oh, I was also fortunate to be part of the open pedagogy, open incubator with the library. And they are fantastic collaborators. And I was brainstorming with them one afternoon on a whiteboard at one of our libraries. And I was talking about how I really wanted students to co-create and uh, uh, read together and share their notes together. And that was my goal for this, this uh, assignment. And we've been doing reading scientific articles for a long time in that course and using different uh, rubrics or frameworks. And uh, Micah Vandergriff from um, NC State Library said, Carlos, you need hypothesis. And I remember stopping him and I said, yes, part of the activity is students identify the hypothesis in the papers. No, no, you need to really look into hypothesis and have students annotate within a group. And he set me up and uh, really helped explain how it could help. And it's been, it, it has snowballed from there. And I'm learning from you and others how we can really engage students. Again, thank you all for again joining us today and, sh and again sharing your expertise and wisdom. I'm wondering if you might kind of deepen you know, your engagement with social annotation through perhaps a story or an example. Um, you all wear multiple hats, both again as science educators and also as researchers 
of science education and how a variety of learners are deepening their disciplinary engagement through social annotation. And I'm wondering for folks who may typically associate annotation maybe with the humanities or with personal marginalia and may not necessarily associate social annotation with the sciences, people may have a hard time kind of like imagining what does that really look like? And again, because you're all working, whether it's in labs or in courses or in professional scientific education initiatives, what does this really look like from your perspective? Can you share a few, some, sto some stories with us? I'd love to hear some of those from, from, all, from all of you. Sure, um, I, I can go first this time. Um, so for me in, in my work, I am very interested in sharing what scientists find with, with everyone, you know, the general public, undergrads, high school students, whoever it is, um, anybody who's really not a trained scientist. Um, and one thing that is, you know, has come up over and over again in our work on this is when you ask someone to read a scientific study, the first thing that they stumble on is the language. Um, it's a very specific, you know, jargon terms, um, scientists, some, sometimes we like to make up words, um, you know, like, like post-translational, <laughs> things like that that make, make sense, sense to us, but they don't necessarily make sense to anyone else. So for us, um, annotation um, does many things, but mostly it really breaks down that language barrier. Um, because when you come across a word that's not intuitive, and you really, you know, a lot of scientific words, you can't even really use context clues to find out, you know, what they mean. Um, so we've done a ton of work with the annotations and just defining vocabulary words as a way to just encourage people to keep reading. You know, this word might trip you up and you're going to stop, but here's that definition. So keep going. <laughs> um, and that has been our, our in, in the sciences, um, our main, you know, the real main benefit of annotations. I'm taking notes as fast as I can, Melissa. <laughs> um, I, I think in a in a complementary way to that um in my courses where where i see you are are making science uh translatable and uh you know participatory for the public right or accessible to the public in my classes i also from day one uh, i teach ecology classes and in ecology you know we have these like basic tenets of biodiversity is important and yet there is not enough, in my opinion, uh, focus on the diversity of humans is important. So from day one, I try to really emphasize, I offer a lot of group work and, and group discussions, whether it's small groups or full class. And it is so important to me uh, for, for all of us to recognize the value of diverse perspectives that you know, we now, there are multiple publications now that demonstrate that diverse humans produce better science. Um, and, and so I think annotation provides a space for students to build confidence to call out, you know, what is this jargon, um, even within a, a STEM class, uh, to become, you know, to break down those barriers to sharing uh, and discussing, you know, assigned readings in, in class discussions, but also to hear, you know, all these different readings uh, I'm thinking about, you know, scrolling through the Langston Hughes poem uh, from the annotated workshop and, and just seeing all those diverse perspectives and readings. And we can get the same diversity of perspectives and the same richness of discussion in a talk about a single um, published journal article, right? Um, so yeah, those are some aspects that I'm really excited about. Yeah, and I can, uh, just following up quickly on what you said, I know in my own teaching, and especially since we've gone online, um, I think students are much more willing to ask a question written, <laughs> you know, in an email or on, on some kind of forum in the chat box as they are out loud. So it, yeah, I think you bring up a great point. Um, putting this stuff in into hypothesis or into an annotation format, you're going to catch more of those students asking questions who never really would have said it out loud or come to office hours or anything like that. Yes, and I think it also provides a space for the the three than me principle that you know I try not to jump right in and answer students questions and wait for a few days, because then I find that you get enhanced you know or increased peer to peer interactions answering those questions for each other. And then if there is a lot of like yeah I didn't get this either, then I can jump in and say oh well actually here's a little bit of, of interpretation to help you. Um, but yeah. 
I I I love the community aspect, and and Erin does a fantastic job creating community in her courses and really emphasizing diversity of ideas. And I teach uh, molecular biology classes, very techniques based, in a biotechnology program that has undergraduate students and graduate students in the same class. So uh, I. I look at that more on the method side of microbial diversity, for example, a class I teach, and I'm focused on the methods. So some of the papers that we look at are really dense. And while we may have grad students that are folk, are have already been reading papers, their fields may be textiles, design, maybe college of vet medicine. So and on the other side, I have undergraduates that are fantastic chemical engineers in their programs or biologists who may not feel comfortable in person talking to the grad student because they are intimidated. And on hypothesis, when we annotate papers together, uh, I also try really hard not to start placing comments and answering uh, questions. But what I've seen is uh, there, there are more interactions between grad students and undergrads. And I would like to quantify that at some point, but my classes are smaller, which is good. And, and then the other thing that's really interesting is uh, we, we tried some papers where we actually had one of the authors, one of the lead authors be part of the class. And they are, uh, I had trouble reading those papers, bioinformatics. And I told students, it's okay to ask questions. And with, with hypothesis, I, I felt like I had to define to scientists and engineers what annotation was. But once, once I came up with our definition of we are going to ask questions, we are going to clarify the text by adding another layer to make it more transparent to us and others what the meaning is. And our idea was, or our goal was to annotate, ask questions, link to YouTube videos or other papers and explain what's going on in this complex scenario. And then once we have a set of annotations, groups of three or four students are tasked with making the page notes. So we mentioned page notes earlier and we use the page notes as a way of trying to summarize uh, annotations in small groups. And that has been a lot of fun. Well, thank you for these, these stories and perspectives. And you know, we've got questions and resources that are now flowing through the chat. And I wanted to also kind of open up in addition to you know, your commentary about social annotation in a class context and some of the pedagogy surrounding that. You've also all embarked upon research, research perhaps about what your own students have been learning and doing, or again, how others are engaging with scientific literature through social annotation. You know, and it strikes me that not every educator, uh, whatever their discipline may be, uh, is gonna choose to start researching the processes by which their students are learning using a variety of new technologies, and yet you all have. And I'd just be curious to hear again from everyone, you know, what motivated you to also look at annotation from a research perspective? And what are some of the key insights, the key findings that you are beginning to glean or that you have identified in regards to the ways in which social annotation does support uh, engagement with scientific, again, terminologies, concepts, student learning, professional learning, as well as science communication. Bring us into your research as well as, again, having previously shared a little bit about your teaching. Okay. I, oh, Aaron, do you want to go? Either way. Oh, you go ahead. I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna take some um, so I guess I, I've been thinking about, I've been learning about the ecology of education and the ecology of learning and thinking a lot about, you know, what about the core ecological concepts like diversity and functionality and, you know, uh, connectivity, right? I'm, I'm thinking about kind of food webs and, and maybe this is a food for thought web. Um, and, and so those are some of the, the concepts and uh, that are shaping questions that I'm asking. Um, again, uh, very much from the perspective of, you know, hypothesis as a tool 
to increase student confidence, but also student community, particularly during this past year of remote learning. Um, so, so I'm asking questions like, uh, and, and some things that I've found from, from quantifying the usage data from my fall class, um, I've found that you do see higher connectivity or more interaction via replies and threads, um, the more that students annotate. So the more you use it, the more you might benefit. Um, I, I've also seen, you know, across the board, no matter what the usage, uh, students overwhelmingly reported that they felt that annotation did increase their confidence and did increase their sense of belonging in class, which felt really exciting. But that has kind of uh, uh, opened some uh, some additional uh, roots for questioning, like, well, what? If, why don't we see you know a tighter correlation with the number of annotations? And Carlos and I started thinking about imposter syndrome and, you know, well, what are the spaces where we might see like a false inflation of annotation that might not correlate to an increase in confidence? So now we're thinking, you know, oh, can we quantitatively identify, you know, usage behaviors that might help us pinpoint some sort of imposter syndrome? And how could we help to address that? Um, how can we help increase student comfort and confidence? Um, so. And I am, I am stuck on this, and I, I blame the libraries a little bit um, on open educational resources and and co-creating. And I I went through a pre-pandemic and then pandemic summer of thinking about my teaching philosophy and thinking about how we teach courses because we teach lab-based courses, and what what I enjoy from the experience and what I uh, love about teaching. And I, I love the equipment and the toys that I haven't had access to in a while, but I also love having students create something. And, and that really drives me. And I think with annotations and summarizing and being able to understand complex terms, or being able to come up with a group of students came up with their tag system for hypothesis to learn about their undergrad research. It really um, emphasizes how creating community and empowering students to, to, to do something. You have the self-efficacy, you agency comes to mind. Helping students discover what they want to learn about and, and not shy them off with a, this is an assignment, you have to read this paper. And I've struggled with that because I want them to annotate, but I don't want it to be a checkbox. And I think Aaron and our experiences have really helped on the instructor side, comparing notes and learning about, okay, how can we do this better to not shy away some students and shy away is probably not the right word or encourage everyone to contribute in a way that's meaningful and where it's comparison free, which may be dreamland and impossible, but so that they can share ideas in a way that others can build on those. And it's not a requirement, it's a community. Okay, so I've I've come at this very different, <laughs> um, and and there's two different ways that that I've I've done research with annotations. Um, the first way is I, I do a lot of work with graduate students and professional development, um, specifically graduate students who don't want to necessarily stay in academia and they're looking for these quote unquote alternative careers um, out outside of of working in an academic lab. Um, and the way we use annotations with the grad students is, like I mentioned before, that training, um, teaching them how to, how to translate complex science for a general audience. Um, and it's always amazing to me that grad students don't recognize that they have these skills um, because I think grad students go through training and for them it's just normal, um, you know, because they spend every day looking at these words and kind of translating to themselves in their head and they don't see it as a skill. Um, so we, we use the annotation process to show them, no, you really do have a skill um, and you can really turn this scientific paper into something that the, the, you know, the, the rest of the world can use and benefit from. 
Um, so kind of, kind of what, what, what Aaron was mentioning, we do see um, confidence changes when, when they go through this. They do you know, start to realize, oh, I, I can contribute um, to, the, to you know, the larger society. Um, and they do increase some of their, um, sk their communication skills um, specifically, you know, learning how, you know, what parts of the paper to annotate, how to annotate, what to include in the annotation, um, those kinds of things. Um, and the other benefit to the annotation process is at the end of it, they have like a tangible packet that they can take with them, you know, on interviews or put in a portfolio or, or something like that, showing that, that you know, they've, they've actually done this. They came up with this product and it's out there in the, in the world and, you know, and someone's using it. Um, so that's kind of what I've, I've been investigating on the professional development side of things. Then um, as far as students reading other people's annotations, we use that with first year undergraduates in intro biology courses. Um, and uh, you know, you can't just give a freshman student a, a scientific paper and say, here, go read this. It's really cool. It's really interesting. You're gonna, know, you're gonna need to know this for the rest of your scientific career and good luck. <laughs> um, there's all kinds of research out there, um, some of my own about barriers that uh, students face when they go to read um, a scientific paper. And so what we've done with the annotations is design them specifically to start reducing those barriers. So, you know, vocabulary is a big one. Methods is a big one. Um, Cause a lot of these students, they're, they're intro bio students. They might not necessarily know what a Western blot is or, you, you know, what, you know, how, how to titrate something. Um, so we, we get really get into the methods um, section. Um, so, and, and again, that, that shows the graduate students writing the annotations that they really do have valuable skills and the undergrads who then read them, it helps them, you know, better understand what, why we need scientific papers, how the scientific community uses scientific papers, both to, you know, advance science and to tend to teach others. And it eliminates a lot of those frustration barriers that would initially turn students off. Um, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm working on this now actually, I'm not sure it increases their motivation and their confidence to keep reading PSL. I think it does. I don't have the hard numbers on that yet, um, but that, that is something that, that we're working on right now. And um, another thing I think the annotations do with the undergrads who go on to read them is it helps them learn strategies for breaking down complex text. So they'll, you know, they'll start to realize, oh, all these words that I don't know are defined in the future, when I see a word I don't know, maybe I should take the time to define it. <laughs> um, and you know, t taking like like chunks of text and writing it, um, you know, in your own words or in, in simpler language. I think that's also a strategy um, that they pick up ju just seeing annotations and, and knowing that they're there. Again, thank you so much for this. Again, really keen insight from, again, a research perspective on how students in science, again, and professionals and graduate students are, are, are learning and engaging with this practice. Um, we're about to transition into some Q&A with, again, the many attendees who are here. And as I'm looking at the chat, there are a lot of questions that are coming through, but I, I'm hoping to, that I might just, just kind of wrap up with one more question for the, for the three of you, um, which is that I don't mean to pigeonhole annotation since it's something that I care a lot about and study, but it often is associated again with maybe the humanities or the social sciences, or again, informal kind of personal reading. And I wonder if the three of you have recommendations specifically for other science educators who may hear about social annotation and kind of say, huh, that sounds uh, interesting. Or maybe to reference Carlos's story earlier, like hypothesis, oh, you're talking about the hypothesis of a study, not a tool. And I'm just curious, again, given your various areas of expertise, and again, your deep experience with social annotation, do you have a recommendation for other science educators who, again, may be curious or hearing about this for the first time? Where and how might they begin this process of dipping their toes into the pedagogical affordances of, of social annotation? Um, personally, my advice is don't be afraid of the technology. Your students will get it, even if you don't. <laughs> Um, and, and to be honest, I think that has worked in my favor because a few times I haven't known how to do something and they've showed me. Um, that's great for them to know that they're also teaching me and I think it builds a little more of a rapport um, between us. So don't, I, don't be afraid of the technology. Yeah, that's, that's excellent, Melissa, thanks. I think also 
I've tried to build in practice time either as part of my welcome letter, like here's the syllabus, uh, we are going to be using hypothesis. So go ahead and open an account and then practice. So I'll, I'll have a link to the get started for students uh, tutorial. And then I've, I've shown screenshots or recorded a brief video in Zoom. Um, and then I asked them to annotate the syllabus. So it's a very low stakes and it helps, you know, uh, make sure that we all understand what's required. And, and they have helped me to identify like, oops, I did not update that date from last time I taught this class. Um, so that way, you know, before we're halfway into the semester, you know, everybody's on the same literal page in the first week of class. Um, and, and what I want to add to that now is in addition to uh, introducing it in the welcome letter, also carving out some time on day one just to make sure that everybody has, you know, a guided 15 minutes, like let's all go to the same page, the same as we did in the annotated workshop earlier. You know, I think that's so helpful. Um, yeah, and as, as Melissa said, it, it's hugely helpful to get the students on the same page, but also to uh, afford them opportunities to correct and enlighten me. It, it has changed, but, uh, I, every semester, and it, I've tried hypothesis in that now four different classes and different topics of papers or different types of assignments. And one thing I've, don't be scared of the technology and also have the students ask questions. Uh, what I try to do now is when I was in person and I've just finished co-teaching this class with my better half, uh, Claire would point at me and say, okay, Dr. Goller, how do we use hypothesis? And I would bring it up on the screen and we would start, and this is what we're going to do. We're going to annotate this paper. And it's really neat because now we can uh, talk to us as we read this paper. And what I've done online is I've, I've filmed screencasts of, of me going over the assignment expectations and how it's going to work and actually going through annotation and putting some annotations in. And I've honestly, in some of the videos, I've, I've fumbled and done and didn't do it within the right group or, and students get to see what's going on and see that, oh yeah, I, there are so many options I can do. I can bring in rich text and links and, I also try to, as Erin mentioned, emphasize it throughout the course. Our courses are typically eight weeks. So I, we have to be up and running really quickly. So after we read a paper, I try to summarize in a video summary and walk them through with my screen open, with a uh, uh, hypothesis open, show them how we went from a blank layer to this layer, as we just did an hour ago, layer full of annotations, 140 annotations on this paper and say, you created this. And now let's make, let's make some sense out of this. What do we want to extract from your comments? Again, thank you. This is just so, for me, at least I'll just speak for myself. So it, 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 informative. And so again, I just want to thank, the, you know, all of you for joining us today. And I'm gonna really just shut myself up now. I know that Nate, uh, Hypothesis colleagues, also Franny have been looking at the chat a little bit more closely than, than I have. Um, and this is a time to turn things over to all of our attendees and to elicit questions from those who've joined us today, um, whether questions have already been asked in the chat or folks want to drop those questions into the chat right now. Um, or we can also promote folks if they wanna also uh, share their questions, you know, uh, by, by speaking it out, um, the, the floor is open. Yeah, I think it's actually, a, you guys have been doing a really good job of sort of addressing things both in chat and uh, and live as we've been talking. I have noticed that um, a lot of folks are, have been centering around this idea of, you know, how to make sure learners of any age really are, you know, um, kind of able and empowered to actually um, use social annotation technology. And you guys have been addressing that already. Um, and there've been a lot of ideas floating around 
about you know using video um like carlos was just talking about the demonstrations and so forth and i just i think it's um i think that we should stress that it's never true that you can assume everybody is just going to be able to pick it up and use it easily with no problems it might be that way for some but it's not going to be that way for everyone and so if you i'm sure that you can all speak to how you've had to sort of support different levels of kind of ease and facility with social annotation in your classes and it could be that you have sort of pointers on how to um how to start the exercise of annotation off um in in ways that make it easier to figure out who needs more help and and who's ready to go uh, i know Ramy himself has a lot of practice in this area too I, I don't need to <laughs> necessarily need to kind of share my my fumblings and my Dr. McCartney, please. <laughs> yeah, I don't um, I don't usually do annotations in a social group, which I'm realizing now that I'm listening to all of you. Um, the grad students kind of do them on their own, and then the the undergrads read them um, on their own. Um, so I do not have a great um, answer for this, although I'm interested to hear um, what everybody else thinks. So uh, we use. I've been using two different things. So for one class, I I change the, the articles every every time I offer the class, and we just have one group, and we keep on annotating in that group because the previous articles are still techniques and approaches that are used, and students can refer back to them, and students can actually see the examples of how. Uh, one paper had 150 annotations. Um, for other classes, I I use the same two papers, so I create a new group every time um, uh, for students to annotate within that group, like Yeast Metabolic Engineering 2021. And it's it's interesting because I see I, I see the lack of and an example in the yeast class uh, at the beginning that could be helpful, but I could uh, share another paper or share some screen grabs. And one thing that I've, I've, we've always have little tech issues, but I'm trying to get students to help each other out and uh, use student forums as a, a place to troubleshoot and ask questions. And once once they realize they are annotating publicly and that's why they can't see the annotations or we should be using this link. Um, and um, it has been really great because the students have understood how to have picked it up really quickly, have helped each other out. I've had an undergrad who is now really committed to open science and really mad that uh, papers behind paywalls, uh, there are issues sharing annotations between institutions. To the point this student who graduated in December now wants to write an op-ed article. And I, I love that. So from, from troubles, we can, make, we can make learning and hopefully, hopefully students learn in the process. Just saw this question come through, so maybe I'll just pick it up from the chat if that's okay. Um, we've got a question from um, you know that asks, you know, thanks a lot for the super interesting discussion. I certainly echo that. You know, can you share a concrete assignment that you that you've done in class? You know, again, for those of us who maybe don't take this form of social peer-to-peer -peer learning for granted, what does this really look like for your students in your in your class? So I've been using uh, hypothesis uh, for jigsaw exercises. So I, I teach a class of 45 to 47 students in the fall. So in order to break that down into what I hope is more manageable sizes and, and for the jigsaw, I divide them into four expert groups. Each group gets assigned one paper. And then I say, you know, uh, so all of the papers are available through our class private group. Um, so they could potentially go and see all of the papers, but they have to, um, create five annotations, a minimum of five. And that way it's a low stakes. I'm giving you credit for reading the paper that I'm expecting you to read to discuss in class. So it seems, you know, fair. 
um, to in a way to acknowledge their efforts. Um, and then I encourage them, you know, I'm going to pick up from the annotated workshop, like if the text is already highlighted, don't create a new comment, reply in the thread. Um, Cause I think that's a fantastic way to increase connectivity. Um, and then I can compare to student behaviors from this fall and see like, does that actually increase, you know, thread length and, and uh, the quality of our discussions. Um, but yeah, I, I think that really has helped again, for them to clarify what the paper means. And then if I give those expert groups 10 minutes to convene and come to a consensus, um, something I want to add to that is maybe they will type a summary page um, and, and compose, you know, what's your one paragraph or two paragraph uh, review, right, your TLDR uh, for other groups um, before they get shuffled into their jigsaws. So. I think we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions if, uh, again, maybe Nate or Franny has seen things come through the chat. Yeah, one thing I just actually wanted to bring out is I see folks are using the chat space to share um, articles that might be good starting places for various, you know, various scientific discussions and various disciplines, and that's great. And I. Um, I can I can understand why sharing them in Zoom chat is maybe not the most efficient way to share resources like this. So I have an announcement to make um, that very soon we'll be um, unveiling a companion site for liquid margins that is specifically designed to allow educators like yourselves to share common resources publicly about your practices. So, for instance, if you you know let's say. Uh, Carlos and Aaron have particular scientific articles that they think are great introductions um, for annotation exercises in their particular discipline. You know, you could share that um, with some even some additional information about how you use it as an assignment and so forth. And so um, look for an announcement to that coming soon. Sorry that it's I wish that I could point you to it today, but I, it's not quite ready. Um, but at any rate, that will maybe get us around this issue of trying to share share a bunch of links and chat quickly before something ends. Um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of um, talk about how the different disciplines might have different um, sort of needs and affordances, right? Um, and I think one suggestion that came out in the chat that was pretty interesting was the idea of instead of moving right to a scientific article, you can also um, use an exercise in um, annotating some sort of maybe mainstream media public treatment of science right and so you can bring the scientific lens to a more popular work if you will um, and have that really be an interesting uh, annotation exercise as opposed to diving deeply into a really rigorous scientific work which like and science in the classroom does so well and i'm wondering if uh Aaron, I saw you nodding as I was talking about that. Do you have like particular experience directing students toward sort of more um, popular publications, if you will? No, I was nodding in like, I totally agree with you. And, and <laughs> I think I, I'm so excited that there might be a shared repository. And I was thinking, oh, and then we can annotate them with like what we do, right? It's perfect. Yes. It comes full circle. Um, I. I give a blend. I, I don't like to label anything as like a classic paper or the paper. And I think that's partially because I, I'm a microbiome researcher and, you know, that's a fairly new field and it's changing all the time as we learn more and as we are humbled continuously by the microbes we study. Right. Um, so <laughs> I don't, I don't want to I, be sessile. I don't want to anchor myself to anything specific. Um, I, so I have often incorporated some of my own research into courses as case studies to give students a chance to challenge me in person if, if they have questions, you know, to practice discourse with a published scientist um, and, and to break down that hierarchy and power dynamic hopefully, but I am even thinking like, I also don't want to inadvertently hold my work as some golden standard because really it's not, you know, it's, uh, it's not where uh, the nature of science is that it's dynamic, that we are learning all the time that, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, every day is a new Copernican revolution, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so no, I don't have a, a today I have a go-to paper, but you know, by next semester, 
maybe they'll all be different. Um, right, they'll all be different, right? Yeah. That makes sense. Sorry if that wasn't the No, no, it was a really interesting one. take. Carlos? Actually, yeah. I have two random comments that somehow I've tried to connect here. So one is um, I have a teaching post, I have research postdoc uh, here at NC State, Jason Witham, who has a ton of experience in bioinformatics and metagenomics, said, I want some teaching experience. Can you help? Can I help with this class? And that was the best Yes, I one of the best yeses I that had last year because he brought expertise and students felt comfortable. Maybe it was because we were using hypothesis usernames, but they felt comfortable saying, I don't know what that means. And I, I really appreciate that. And these were science papers. We'll change them up next semester as we try new projects. And with undergrads, I, I have the pleasure of working with student groups that are undergrad researchers. And without the lab we or lab experiences, students were craving research experience. And I was just amazed and happy and really impressed with what groups of students did once we said, okay, let's find out everything we can about this weird bacterium. And it doesn't have to be science papers. Annotate wiki, annotate uh, public newsletters, try to connect. And students in that case made up their own code for tags and for, um, for, for classifying annotations. And I also did the same thing, Erin. I, I was like, I'm not sure I feel comfortable calling them seminal papers or not. Uh, so students, they came up with their system and then they uh, just ran with it or, or annotated with it and uh, had fun. And in that case, it was the combination of science papers, uh, posts, anything they could think with this key name. Yeah, so with regard to uh, selecting papers, um, it's very hard. And I, a lot of people ask me this question. I do not have an easy answer. Um, it's, it's difficult. It's going to take time. You're going to select some that don't work um, and, you know, learn from what doesn't work on that and, in, you know, keep selecting in the future. Um, it's a couple of things that I have found that usually always work um, is think more about the experimental design in the paper. If it's a like the simpler kind of experimental design, the better. Um, Cause you know, help students follow kind of from the question to the, the experimental design to the methods, um, you know, and, and those, there's really elegant papers out there. I, and I would encourage you guys don't shy away from science and nature. They are shorter papers, but um, because they're short sometimes the experimental design within them is really beautiful. Um, so I, I would look for the experimental design, not so much you know, the, the vocabulary words they're going to use or the length of the paper or the journal, but, but find a really beautiful experiment um, and start there. Um, my second point, kind of bouncing off Aaron, um, I think it's great to select your own papers. And I would totally encourage that because um, research coming out of, of my lab shows that a, a lot of undergrads don't even know that we do research. They don't know research happens, especially I know you guys are at a huge campus like I am. Um, a lot of our freshmen don't even know there's a biology department, um, which seems crazy to us, but, but students who commute, who get out of their car, go to a lecture and then go back to their car, they really don't understand that research is happening on campus. So I think it's totally great to use your own papers and use the, the, the papers from people in your department as a way to show students that this research really happens on campus and they can be a part of it. I mean, all you guys need help, you need volunteers, um, and you know, it, it might help um, kind of the, the sense of community within the department about knowing what's going on, knowing what people are doing and finding out a way uh, to be more involved. I'm just kind of thrilled at the kind of the various directions that this conversation has taken, and particularly on this point about, you know, having researchers who are educators then share with their students their own work 
to engage in a conversation through social annotation that does a variety of things that, that again, you've all mentioned. I just want to revoice this because to me, this is just so important, you know, mentioning things like showing your students that research is happening on campus and that, you know, you are also engaged in this kind of process of scientific inquiry. And then also, you know, to Aaron's point a few moments ago about also potentially troubling to some degree the perceived expert, novice, teacher, student power dynamic that can exist, particularly when, for example, students may be reading, you know, primary source scientific literature, you know, conducted by and written by their own professors, but using social annotation as an entry point to then begin inquisitive conversations about the topics, the terms, the concepts, and the methods. That to me just speaks to just the complexity of learning and the opportunity for social annotation to deepen this, this shared, uh, shared experience. So thank you all so much for, for sharing from your experience. I believe that we're running out of time and I hate to make that transition such a hard one. Um, we're coming up against the hour here and typically these episodes run for about 45 minutes. I didn't know if there were any final concluding comments either that our panelists wanted to share, there was any final insight, resource, or question that you might want to leave us with or if there was any other um, quick commentary or even a bit of housekeeping notes from any of our hypothesis colleagues as we begin to wrap up today's today's liquid margins episode let's let's hear from the panelists first for sure uh, i'll start i had no idea uh so many people were doing annotations so it's been cool to to meet you guys and learn about what you're doing um and I'm, i feel like i'm like re-energized to get back out there <laughs> into that's annotating great. so thank you that's great I, I read Dr. McCartney's paper and I really, really love that the hypothesis community has been so welcoming and vibrant uh, and learning from, from others. And I, I really love that we were able to connect and share some thoughts and resources. And when I had tech questions, how can I get this? Uh, you, you were there. So it has been a really supportive community and I love learning from Erin and other fantastic educators, what they are doing to encourage others to participate. And I think going back to my naive comment, what do you mean hypothesis a couple of years ago at the library? Now, now I can rephrase that and say, okay, how can we deliver the, the guidelines or, or deliver the charge of, because I'm calling it charge now, of we will annotate and I make sense of this together because believe it or not, Carlos does not understand some of the text here. And I think that with 20 of us doing Google searches and being uh, empowered to tag someone else or ask questions or even annotate publicly on the author's article, we can get some answers. Yeah, I absolutely love that, Carlos. And um, I would say first broadly, this has been amazing. Um, I, uh, this has been another, another flavor of, uh, I came to Hypothesis uh, because it seemed to make sense and it seemed really exciting. Uh, and I've been doing things by intuition, but once again, I'm meeting people who are better established and have more experience and, and who just, the chat blowing up this whole time with so many inspiring questions and anecdotes and to be able to connect to this web of like motivated inquiry, right? I mean, at, that's coming full circle to hypothesis and, and to what Carlos has just been saying about it, charging and empowering students to drive and, and you know, satisfy their own inquiries in, instead of, you know, leaning on us and, and I'm there with you, right? As an instructor, I really try to model, yeah, this part of the paper was super confusing too. And, and how amazing to now have a space where we can document that and then muddle through it together. Um, I, I think that's, that's incredible. Uh, it's an incredible tool. It's an incredible revelation for students, um, you know, really democratizing science and education. Thank you. you know, I, I want to uh, just, I don't know, 
for myself personally, just, who's just, I've just been so inspired by this episode, um, but also on behalf of Hypothesis as an organization and the broader social annotation community, I wanna thank Dr. Melissa McCartney. I wanna thank Dr. Aaron McKenney and also Dr. Carlos Galler for joining us today and sharing again your expertise and wisdom with us. Um, also a big shout out and thanks to the OLC, uh, Innovate, uh, both this online gathering and the broader OLC community for kind of hosting us within this broader um, event and making this public and available to, to everyone. Um, this has just been, I think, a really um, kind of edifying and inspiring um, conversation. So just thank you all. I know that resources from, again, the chat and related to this will be shared publicly um, through uh, the Hypothesis Liquid Margins page. They will also probably be shared out on Twitter and other social media channels uh, soon. Um, please continue to stay connected to, again, the Hypothesis community. Um, I've learned from the chat that actually it's episode 19 that's coming up next. So we're going back in time somehow, just somehow kind of apropos for this last you know, year. But in any case, please do again remain engaged with the Liquid Margins webinar series as well as the broader Hypothesis community. And my thanks to everyone who's joined us today. Stay healthy, everyone. Please do take care. <laughs>